first song. Saturday is going to get pushed, and so instead of having it on the 2nd, we're going to have it on the, the 9th, so there's a couple things going on next weekend with the holiday weekend, and then both both Mike and I have a, a funeral that we have to uh, um, attend um, next, next Saturday morning here at the, at the cemetery, so, uh, so it won't be this Saturday, the 2nd, it'll be Saturday, July the 9th at 8 o'clock, so I okay, think that's all we got, all right, go back to worship. Jesus. 
Yeah, the other should come. Dwayne, would you pray for us this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here together in your house. Bless the preacher as we go, he goes to his message. Bless the offering that we're about to give. Amen. Amen. Have your Bible open to Luke chapter 2. We're looking at verse 21 this morning, this one verse, so it should be real quick, right? <laughs> Last week, my watch was dead, the battery was dead. I almost put on the same watch this morning, <laughs> but I did the bit best, the next best thing. I don't have a watch, <laughs> I forgot to get a battery for it. That's okay, because it was just one verse. So we'll be in Luke 2, 21. We'll look at a couple of verses before we get there. But what we've seen up until this point in chapter 2 is that the Messiah has been born in obscurity. He was born in poverty. He was born in humility. God in the flesh was wrapped in linen cloths and then placed in a feed box. The earth did not celebrate the coming of the king, so we see that heaven did. An angel appears to some shepherds in a field proclaiming the good news, the gospel that is for all people. That on that day, God entered into the world. That on that day, a savior was born, who is Christ the Lord. Now the people were expecting the Messiah they wanted a Messiah, they needed a Messiah. But what that meant to them was one that was going to come and overthrow the current political system that they were governed by. One who would come and drive out the Romans and reestablish the throne of David so that they might rule over themselves again. They wanted a Messiah because they wanted autonomy. Sometimes I wonder if that's not what we just want as well. The Messiah that's going to put who we want in political office and then we'll be fine because we know what's best for us. We know how to govern ourselves. We know how to make the right decisions every single time, right? We learned that this morning in 1 Samuel. That if God just gives us what we want, we'll be fine. The Israelites knew that they needed a Messiah. What they didn't know then, what pe many people still don't know today, is that what they really needed was a Savior. His name shall be Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And that's the one thing that most people think that they don't need saving from because they don't see themselves as sinners. I've made some bad choices in my life. I've made some mistakes, a few errors, some miscalculations, some misjudgments. I have a couple of vices that I'm still working on. But these are all what we call victimless crimes. It doesn't hurt anybody else. What I do in my own personal and private life is no one else's business. I'm not a sinner. <coughs> Therefore, they don't need to be saved from their sin. They want to be saved from poverty. So we give them the wealth gospel the prosperity gospel. They want to be saved from sickness. So
So we give them the health gospel. They want to be saved from the injustices of the world. So we give them the social gospel. They want to be saved from the belief that there's more to this ordinary life than what they've been told. So we give them the signs and wonders gospel. But what people really need to be saved from is their sin. So we must give them the only gospel there is. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We're told what he will be, the Savior, and we're told who he is. He is the Christ. He is the Lord. The good news the angel brought is that the Lord himself has taken on the form of his own creation so that he might save them from the only thing that they need to be saved from, and that's their sin. He did not come to save you from anything else. If anything else is added to that gospel, then it's not the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, after Paul's first missionary journey with Barnabas, no longer than he returns back to Antioch, he has to write this first letter. In my opinion, this is his first letter that we have that he's wrote. He writes back to the church in Galatia. Galatia wasn't, it was a territory, a, several churches in this area. Paul had just been there. He made a circuit through each city preaching the gospel and on his way back, he went back to each town, strengthening them and preaching the gospel to them again. No longer as he returns to Antioch, word gets back to Paul that some other people came from behind him, which was what happened throughout his ministry. As soon as he'd leave, another group of people would come in behind him and convince them of a different gospel. In Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, almost tongue in cheek. Paul says, you've turned to another gospel. Oh, by the way, there is no such thing as another gospel. There's only one. But there are some who trouble you, who want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel that's contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed accursed. There is no other gospel. There's only one. And that's the gospel that Jesus Christ came to save you from your sins. That we are saved by grace through faith. Now at the opposite end of the spectrum, at the end of Paul's ministry in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the last book that Paul wrote. So we go from the first in Galatians to the last in 2 Timothy. Paul's come to the end of his life. Timothy's in Ephesus, overseeing the church as Paul's representative there. Paul's in Rome in prison. His case has been adjudicated. He's received the news that he's about to be executed. He writes to Timothy, to give him some last words of encouragement and also pleading with him to stop what he was doing and come to see him. He wanted to see Timothy one last time before he died. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul exhorts Timothy to do this. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, 
who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, to do what? Preach the word. You can't get any stronger language than that. Paul says, I charge you in the very presence of God. I charge you in the presence of Jesus Christ, the one who will judge you, the one who will judge everyone, who by his appearing will bring about his kingdom. He will usher in that kingdom. Paul says, I charge you to do what, Timothy? Preach the word. This is the word. It's God's word. All scripture is God breathed. All scripture is inspired by God. Therefore, if it is God breathed and inspired by God, then why would anyone preach any other word? Paul says if they preach any other word, let them be accursed because there is no other gospel. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove. Correct those who need to be corrected. Rebuke those who need to be rebuked by the word. But do it with gentleness and fear, as Peter would say. Exhort, plea with those to take God's word seriously and apply it to their lives. But do it with complete patience and teaching. So why is Paul telling Timothy to do this? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. It's the same word we use for doctrine. People will not endure sound doctrine. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. People will be convinced that there is another gospel because they will no longer endure sound doctrine or sound teaching. They don't want to be reproved by God's word. They certainly don't want to be rebuked by it. They don't need to be exhorted by it. No, they want a gospel of comfort gospel of inclusion, gospel of acceptance. They will have itching ears. They'll accumulate themselves teachers to suit their own passions, whatever that passion is, health, wealth, prosperity, social justice, inclusion, sexual immorality, all their own passions and they'll build churches upon those passions. They'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But for you, Timothy, for you, pastor, preacher, teacher, Sunday school teacher, for you, Christian, be sober-minded, endure suffering. Paul doesn't say run from suffering, avoid suffering, look out for it. He assumes that if you do everything that he just told you to do, you're going to suffer. People will not endure sound doctrine, but Paul says you endure the suffering because you will teach sound doctrine. Because you endure sound teaching and sound doctrine, then you must endure the suffering that's gonna come with it. Do the work of an evangelist Go tell people about Jesus. Fulfill your ministry. If you're a Christian, you have a ministry. It might not be vocational ministry to be a pastor or a preacher, but if you've given your life to Christ, he has given you a ministry. He has given you a gift to be used for his kingdom. Go and fulfill it. Preach the word, the gospel, in which there is only one. It's the good news. The angel brought good news for all people. Our Savior, 
has been born. Not only a Savior, but he is Lord and Savior who came to save us from our sin. People want a Messiah, just not the one that God sent. People want to be saved, just not from their sin. But that's what Christ came to save us from. That's the only thing he came to save us from. Luke chapter 2, verse 21. At the end of the eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. On the eighth day, Jesus was brought forth to be circumcised just as the law commanded him to be in Genesis 17, 12. As we've looked when we've gone through Genesis and we, a few weeks ago when John was brought to be circumcised in Genesis 17, 12, when God makes the covenant with Abraham, every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A male child was circumcised. He is now part of the covenant. That was the law. Once he was circumcised, he is now under the law. When the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus identified himself with us as being born under the law. If you turn to Galatians 4, Paul explains Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. He was born of a woman. He was born under the law. Christ placed himself under the law in which he gave in the Old Testament. He is the Lord. It was his law that he gave. He subjected himself to his own law. Even though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. When he took on human form, he did not hold on to that prerogative. Even though he was God, he did not use that as a reason to bypass the requirements for man when he became a man. He was in the form of God, but he took on the form of a slave. And what that meant is being born under the law. And he had to, because in order to redeem those under the law, he himself had to be born under the law in order to live a perfect and righteous life in order to fulfill the law. We focus a lot on his birth and his death, as we should, but what we don't focus nearly enough on is his life, because we needed all of it. We needed his birth, we needed the incarnation, we needed his death, the crucifixion, the atonement, we needed the resurrection for our justification. But sandwiched in between all of those things is 33 some odd years of life. A sinless and perfect life under the law. He lived sinless perfection. If it was only his blood that was required for our redemption, then God would have let him be killed when Herod ordered all the babies, male babies under two years old, to be killed in Bethlehem on that night of the slaughter of innocents. He could have been born, lived a short period, and then just been killed right away. And that would have been that. 
But it's not only his birth and death, death that are significant for our redemption, but it's his life, his life that he lived under the law. He had to fulfill the law. He had to live a perfect and righteous life under the law. That's the righteousness that he gives us when we're saved. He lived a life that we could not and fulfilled the law. And then he died the death that we could not to suffer our judgment and wrath. This is what's called that beautiful exchange. He took upon our sin and gave us his righteousness. There were two people at that cross, us and Jesus. We stood there in our sin, condemned under the law. Rebellion against God. And then there was Jesus who stood there in his righteousness because he fulfilled the law in all its perfection. And then when it came time for us to be crucified, Jesus took our place. He took upon our sin, our iniquities, our judgment and our wrath and then gave us his righteousness. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.20. That old hymn, Have You Been to the Cross, where the Lord Jesus suffered? Have you been to Calvary? Have you been to the redemption for sinners? Have you been to Calvary? It was there on Calvary that God's dear Son laid down his life for you. While there's time, don't delay. Place your faith in Christ Jesus. Turn your eyes now to Calvary. Have you been to the cross? I have been to the cross because that was my cross to bear. That was supposed to be me to be crucified upon that cross because I am the sinner. I rebelled and rejected God. I lived an immoral life. It was my sins. It was my cross. Yet he stepped in for me and took my sins upon himself and then gave me his righteousness. He was born of a woman. He was born under the law in order to redeem those under the law. He identified himself with us. We needed a savior. And that's what he came to do. In Romans chapter eight, Paul tells us what took place there during that exchange on the cross. Romans 8, 1 through 4. Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Without Christ, you are condemned because you're a sinner. You've sinned against God. You deserve judgment and wrath. And that's the only thing that the law could do for us. It pointed out our failures. It pointed out our sins, and therefore it condemned us. And the wages of sin is death. But if you are in Christ Jesus, Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation. You are not guilty. You've been justified by Christ. 
He fulfilled the law for you. He has freed you from its consequences. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Paul uses a play on words here with the word law. We were born under the law, God's word and God's law. And we've all fallen short of it because we've all sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. However, when Christ lived that perfect and righteous life and offered himself as that pleasing, atoning sacrifice, Paul says, there's now a new law. It's the law of spirit and life. And if you are in Christ Jesus, that law of spirit and life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You were condemned under the law of sin and death, but Christ Jesus has set you free because that's what he came to save you from, from sin. He's come to give you life. God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. The law only pointed out our failures, only pointed out our sins and condemned us to death. But God did what the law could not do and that was save us. The law could not save you, only condemn you. But by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was not sinful flesh. He came in the likeness. He took on the form of a slave. He took on human form, identifying himself with us in the likeness of sinful flesh. But he condemned that sin in the flesh at his crucifixion. Through his righteousness, he did that in order that the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. When he gave us his righteousness, we have now fulfilled the law because of him. We are no longer condemned by it, but we have been set free from it by the law of the spirit of life. And we no longer walk according to the flesh, but now walk according to the spirit. Jesus identified himself with us in order to live the life we could not live, to die the death we could not die. In Matthew chapter three, Jesus identifies himself with us in his baptism. Just like he identified himself at his birth, being born of a woman, being born under the law, in his life, and fulfilled the righteous requirement of it. In Matthew chapter three, verses 13 through 17, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. We'll see later on when we get into Luke that John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. But yet Jesus comes and presents himself to John. And Matthew tells us John would have prevented him from doing so, saying, it's I who need to be baptized by you. And yet you come to me, but Jesus answered him, let it be so. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He was fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law when he identified himself with us. In his baptism, he identified himself as that one who was born in sinful flesh. In his baptism, he identified himself with us. After the resurrection, 
Paul would say in Romans 6, in our baptism, we now identify ourselves with him. That role has been reversed. Paul tells us, don't you know that you've been baptized? You've been baptized into Jesus' death. When we come forward for baptism, we present ourselves, identifying ourselves with Jesus, to come stand at the cross, to admit that we are the sinner who deserves to be crucified. And we are crucified with Christ. And we nail our sins to the cross. And just as Jesus died and was buried, we bury ourselves into that watery grave. And Jesus was raised in glory to a newness of life. We too are raised out of the water into glory and to a newness of life. He came to identify himself with us. When we come to him, we now identify ourselves with him. He was born under the law to come redeem those who are under the law. Back in Luke 2, 21, at the end of the eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. He was called Jesus. His divine purpose can be seen in his name. He was called Jesus, the Lord saves. He came and identified himself with us so that we might, by grace, through faith, identify ourselves with him. He was born under the law to redeem those from under the law. The law of spirit and life is greater than the law of sin and death. And God sent his son to do what the law could not do, and that is to save us from its condemnation. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you are no longer a slave to sin, but now a son. And if a son, Paul says, then an heir, an heir to his kingdom. We went from slave to sin, slave to sin to son to heir. By grace you have been saved through faith. Have you been to the cross? Have you been to Calvary? It's the place of redemption for sinners. While there's time, don't delay. Place your faith in Christ Jesus. Turn your eyes now to Calvary. Right. Father, we thank you for this morning that you've given us that in the fullness of time, in your perfect time, you sent forth your son to be born of a woman, to be born under the law, so that he might redeem us from <coughs> under the law. And he redeemed us from the righteous requirement of that law that has condemned us to death but because of his righteousness he has fulfilled it and he was made to be sin so that in him we might be declared righteous and he was raised for our justification so now when you look upon us you no longer see a slave to sin you see a son you see an heir because you're rich in mercy that even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you raised us up together with him. That even while we were still sinners, Christ died for each one of us. We pray that if there's anyone here who's never been to the cross, who's never turned their eyes to Calvary, to see the redemption that hangs from the cross, 
the Savior who came to save them from their sin, that today is that day that the sword of your word has pierced their heart and mind, that they might come forth and see themselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. Father, we pray that you will speak to each one of us. You know our faults and our failures, the things that we struggle with. Convict us of those things that we might overcome them. Help us fulfill the ministries that you've given to each one of us in the days and months to come that we might endure the suffering to come because we endure sound doctrine. We stand on your word. Every single word it says, regardless of what the culture and the world thinks about. We pray for the strength to do so, even in the faces of the people that we love, that we might share your word with them, with patience, with kindness, with love, with confidence. Father, we praise and honor and glorify your name. For it's that name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, we pray that today is that day. There are many things that the world wants to be saved from, but the thing that he came to save you from is your sin. You must identify yourself as a sinner in order to identify him as your Savior. That's what he came to do. He was born under the law to live a life of righteousness under the law. So when he presented himself to the Father on that cross, he was a perfect and spotless lamb who has come to take away the sin of the world. If you have any questions about repentance, about salvation, baptism, or anything else, I'd love to talk with you after service about it. At this time, I ask everybody to please stand. We're going to worship through song one more time, and we'll be dismissed. Have you been to the cross where the Lord Jesus suffered? Have you been?
Yeah. Uh-huh.